For those who happen to be uh, joining with us online, here is a very quick reminder. In just a few moments, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper in person. Uh, if you're joining us online, uh, please feel free to participate with us there in your own home, wherever you might be. But you might take just a moment if you're at your own home to get some bread, to get some juice, and then join with us, if not in person, at least in spirit. Um, every time that we come to the Sunday that we celebrate the Lord's Supper, there is a, there is a very specific woman in my life that, that I always think about her testimony. Uh, she went through an extremely difficult season of her life. Uh, she had a divorce. Uh, her family just kind of all fell apart. And um, she went a long, long, long time just not even going to church. And as, uh, as I met her years later and as I talked to her, and, and she was so committed, she still is, in her, in her home country where she lives, she is a delightful person, always sharing in the worship services, always sharing with others. But, uh, but back to her story, as, as I met her, I said, well, how did you get reconnected to the church? And she shared the heartbreak, the divorce, the terrible situations that happened in life afterwards. And she said, and then for some reason, God spoke to my heart. And I went back to a church, and it happened to be the Sunday that they were having the Lord's Supper. And she said, in the midst of celebrating the Lord's Supper, God touched my heart. And there was hope again. And he did something. He started working in my heart once more. And so every time that we have the Lord's Supper, I can still think of this, this beautiful person and how there was a time in her life that that simple thing that we're going to be able to per participate in today, simple but profound, that that was the moment that God touched her heart in a deep and special way. And from that day until now, like I said, I, I've always known her after. <laughs> I, never, I never knew her before. I never knew the, during, the, during those years of heartbreak. I've always known the delightful, caring person that she is. But even today, you and I will have the chance for our own hearts to be, to be touched. We want to know Christ. We want to grow in Christ. We want to show Christ to the world. That's our desire. Uh, Antonio, I know. I saw Antonio. Where is Antonio? I need Antonio. Anto there you are, Antonio. Please come on forward. <laughs> Antonio will be leading us today. Antonio the Younger. There is Antonio the Elder. <laughs> there is Antonio the Younger. Uh, Antonio will be joining, will be leading us today as we all stand and as we read Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 through 24 together. Antonio, please come and lead us in that. I will be reading Jeremiah 9, 20, uh, verse 20. Behold, behold, the days are coming. Be, wait, no. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in the wisdom. Let not the might man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in him this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declared the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. This is the reading of God's word and all of God's children said, Amen. Father, as we come today, Father, we are reminded in your word that Jesus Christ is to be high and lifted up, and that, Father, if somehow, if somehow, Father, we can do that, if we can raise Jesus, that he will draw all men, all women, all the world unto himself. And so, Father, today, as we gather, as we worship you, as we praise you, Father, it is our heart's desire for Jesus to be high and lifted up. It's in your son's name that we pray. 
Amen. Nikolai, will you continue? Good morning, church. How y'all doing? Raise your left hand and say, praise the Lord, my left hand. Come on. Raise your right hand and say, praise the Lord. And all together, like, praise the Lord. For the Bible said, it's not by, this, by the might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And we say, praise the Lord for that, you know. Let us love the Lord because what? Because we're good. No, because he loved us first, right? That's the key. And uh, our worship song, I would all will boast. Wise man boasting his wisdom, or the strong man boasting his strength, and not the rich man boasting his riches. in his riches let the humble come and give thanks to the one who made us the one who saved us I will boast in the Lord my God I will boast in the one who's worthy I will boast in the Lord my God I will boast in the one who's worthy I will boast
praise the Lord and clap your hands. Come on. He's good. Thank you, and you may be seated. Wong, Doug, Godwin, if you men would please come and join me at the table. As an international church, compared to other international churches, we are completely normal. (laughs) Compared to normal churches, we are a bit unusual. Recognizing that when it comes to international churches, we are like many international churches. Through the course of a year, people from more than 40 different countries come and worship together. And of course, with such diversity, there are many different teachings and many different churches, and we respect that. Um, Regardless of what church you've come from today, uh, regardless of if you're only here today or if you're here for an extended season of time, when it comes to the Lord's Supper, this is the teaching that we follow. The Lord's Supper is for everyone who has accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. We acknowledge that people come from so many different churches, and some churches have a teaching that you must be a member of that exact church in order to participate. We understand that teaching, we respect that teaching, but that's not the teaching that we follow. In our hearts, as we read the scripture, the Lord's Supper is open to everyone who has accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. That is important. If you've never come to a point in your life that you've accepted Christ as your Savior, then we would ask that you simply let the elements pass by. A second teaching that we try to follow is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where each person is to examine their own heart before they participate in the Lord's Supper. On our own, none of us are worthy. We acknowledge that. But by accepting Christ, by seeking to be in right relationship with him and with others, we are allowed to participate in this time. So as we do continue in this time, we would ask each person to take a moment to just quietly bow your head, quietly close your eyes, quietly have just a moment of reflection where you consider your own heart your own relationship with God, speaking to him as we then continue on in this time of worship. Let's all quietly have a moment of self-reflection. Father, because you first loved us, even while we were still sinners and even while we were still hostile, Father, against you, Father, you gave us your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Jesus would not perish, but have eternal life. And Father, today, as we remember what he did for us, as we seek to lift Christ high and holy, Father, Lord, as we look at our own hearts, we pray, Father, that you would continue to guide and cleanse us. We pray, Father, that you would lead us to be in right relationship with you as well as right relationship with others. Father, may each of us in our own hearts acknowledge our own sin, acknowledge our own guilt, acknowledge our own unworthiness, Father, on our own efforts. And at the same time, Father, we rejoice that because of the work of Christ, because of his cleansing of our sins, Father, we may participate in this time. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul was speaking to the early church, and Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, 
that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. Uh, Wong, would you please have our prayer for the break? Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for your grace, love, and mercy. And today we can come before your table. Lord, we thank you. You sacrificed yourself, broken your body for our sin and restored our relationship with our Heavenly Father and give us eternal life. Lord, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we need you to be with us and guide us for our daily life, not boast men, money, any power, only boast you. Get us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> In First Corinthians chapter 12, Paul said, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would be the body? Where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. And then going to verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts and I will show you a still more excellent way. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul continues and says, In the same way also he took the cup. Godwin, would you please have our prayer for the cup? 
the dear Lord, we thank you for your children that are here before you this morning, Father Lord Jesus. That as we want to take the cup, Father, I will take it under your glory and your honor, Father. Father, release your healing power upon every one of us here and use that, your blood that you share on the cross for us, Father, to purify every family in this church today. And those that are not here, that are not participating in this, uh, this uh, drink, Father, Lord, we pray, Father, you touch them, you protect them and guide them, Father. In your son's name I pray, amen. Continuing in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul said, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Doug, if you would help me in just a special way. Did everyone who wanted to receive the bread receive the bread? If not, if you would just quietly raise your hand, we will take it. Okay. And has everyone who wanted to receive the cup received the cup?
Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And Paul explained, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Doug, would you please have our prayer of thanksgiving? Let's pray. Father God, uh, we thank you so much uh, for everything uh, that you give us. Uh, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the, the sunshine, um, the air that we breathe, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the food that you provide for us and the shelter and the clothing, Lord, all the basic things. We are so grateful, Lord, uh, that you give these things to us. But on the top of our list, Lord, it has to be your uh, willingness to go to the cross for our sins, for the sins of mankind, uh, so that uh, you could pay a debt uh, that we could uh, never repay God. And we are so grateful for that as well. And we just thank you that uh, you went to the cross and three days later you rose again to uh, sit at the right hand of God the Father. And Lord, uh, we just ask for your strength and your mercy and your love today. And we just are grateful and thankful, Lord, uh, for everything that you give us. Father, we love you and we're desperate for you this day and every day. And we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. In some churches that you've come from, they have a moment that they briefly call extending the hand of fellowship. Just briefly, would you extend a hand of welcome to someone around you and just say the simple words, may God bless you today. As we continue with our worship service, uh, Francois will be meeting with our teenagers so any of our teenagers 13 to 18 years old uh, Francois where are you going today upstairs upstairs okay so any of our teenagers 13 to 18 years old that would like to slip out with Francois you may do that at this moment do we have any of our teenagers with us today that want to go with Francois for the special time. This is for our teenagers, 13 to 18 years old, and they are going that way. We want to have a prayer for our children and our teenagers. It's the month of August. As soon as we get back to the academic school year, the month of September, we have a full program, nursery program, children program, youth program. In the month of August, we know that there's a lot of changes so we do want to have a special prayer for all of our children, for all of our teenagers as they go. Today, it's just our teenagers, but as they go for their special time, please join me as we have a special prayer for all of our children, for all of our teenagers. Father, you bless us with life. You bless us, Father, with families. Father, one of the greatest joys of our lives are the joys, Father, that we receive from the children that you give to us. Father, please bless Francois and the teenagers as they have their own unique time today, Father, studying and talking together. Father, please bless all the children of our congregation, Father. May they each grow in wisdom and in stature. May they each, Father, grow in their relationship with you and in their relationship with others. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Nikolai. Dear brothers and sisters, let us all continue in our worship. And let us all stand up, please.
mountain stream, every sunset sky, every month request, Lord, my only end is that you reign in me again. Over all the earth, you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky. By my one request, Lord, my only aim is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? to reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams, in my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am, so won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power. Darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign?
as you're seated, if you'd please find your own copy of Scripture. There are a few things as a church that we try to make available to people at both doors. There's a small table here. There's a small table back in the coffee area. If you do not have your own copy of Scripture, if you would like an English copy of Scripture, please take uh, one of these Bibles. We don't, we don't have them there simply for a display item. Uh, we, we hope that they're taken, that they're used, that they're read. So if you need an English Bible, please, at this door and at that door, please take a Bible. Also, we've been looking at a, an, an interesting, a little bit of an unusual study. This is not what we normally do. But in the book of Proverbs, during these, these summer months, very intentionally, there's a unique section in Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 22, where the writer says, I've collected 30 sayings for you. And these sayings are meant to be extremely practical for his child as his child matures and goes into life. There's a, there's a simple little piece of paper again at this door, at that door, and it has listed, there's actually more than 30 sayings. As we read through it, it's, it's 30 plus five. <laughs> so there's actually 35 sayings. And each Sunday, we've just been going through three of these sayings, these wise sayings. But they're not, they're not listed as philosophical concepts. They're listed as practical instructions so that this man's children, so that this man's sons can take these teachings and then apply them to their lives. And uh, if, you've, if you've never done this before, I would encourage you to do this. Take one of these simple pieces of paper and each day of the month, look, if it's, for instance, tomorrow will be August the 14th, look at saying number 14. <laughs> And, and read it and think about it and see how it could apply to your life. Now, today, we're looking at sayings 25, 26, 27 in Proverbs chapter 24. We're also looking intentionally at the New International Version. There are many different translations of the Bible, and there are slightly different divisions that happen in the different translations so that we can all be trying to look at the same scripture at the same moment, we're looking at Proverbs chapter 24, intentionally at the New International Version. Um, our next slide, Louisa. Uh, those of you that have been involved in boxing, uh, maybe you know this saying. I don't know, I don't know what athletics you've participated in. During my life, there were different athletic events that I competed in. Uh, mainly running, that was my main, but there was also American-style football, there was basketball, there was volleyball, occasionally there was wrestling, there was boxing. In boxing, there is this, there is this principle. It's a really good plan, okay, before you have the, mox, the boxing match. We all have this, it's a really good plan. Oh, I know what I'm going to do when I step into the arena, arena with this other competitor. It's a really good plan until, until you receive the first punch in the face. And when you get that first punch in the face, it's easy for that really good plan to be forgotten and to be abandoned. In Proverbs chapter 24 today, verse 10 in the New International Version translation, saying 25, there's this principle, if you falter in a time of trouble, how small is your strength? Now, we all tend to make ourselves the hero of every story that we tell about ourselves within our minds. It's just the human nature. Whenever we're telling a story about what has happened, whenever we're thinking about would I be courageous if I were in that moment? Would I be the one who stood up? Now, the cold, hard fact, the cold, hard fact is that most of us are not courageous. That's the cold, hard fact. In our minds, we are. What we say to ourselves, we are. But when the blows of life begin to hit us, we don't tend to be that courageous. In fact, it's very sad. This has been proven 
in all cultures around the world, if someone is being attacked on the street, the vast majority of people do what? Rush in and stop the attack? No. They step back and watch it unfold. And so we read the stories, and they can become somewhat philosophical, but in Exodus chapter 4, just keep it, keep it right here, Louisa. I don't have, okay, just keep it right here. In Exodus chapter 4, Moses was told, go back to Pharaoh's court. <laughs> he was going to go back and face Pharaoh and say to Pharaoh face to face, God has spoken, you need to let the children that have been held in bondage for hundreds of years, you need to let them go. This was not a philosophical challenge. This was going to be a real live activity. And in Exodus chapter 14, we see that after all of the things that have happened, the children are let go. But then we go into Joshua chapter 3, after the children have wandered around, and there came the point that the priest had to step into the river's waters. Yes, God was going to miraculously lead them into the promised land, but they had to take the step into the water. And we know in 1 Samuel chapter 17 that David had to face Goliath. There came the time that he had to face Goliath, and there was the time in Matthew chapter 14 after Jesus fed the 5,000. It's the only miracle that's recorded in all four of the Gospels. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are, different, there are different miracles that are listed. And when we put it all together, we see a combination of all the miracles. The only miracle that's repeated in all four Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. And in Matthew chapter 14, after Jesus feeds the 5,000, he tells the disciples to go across the river, and they go across, excuse me, across the, the lake, and as they're growing across the lake, he comes walking down hours later, and he's walking on the water, and he calls for Peter, step on out of the boat, join me out here in the waves. And so it moves from being a philosophical concept into a practical reality, and in Hebrews chapter 11, there's the full chapter full chapter of men and women full of faith and action. But if you falter in a time of trouble, how small is your strength? Three weekends ago, I live, uh, I don't want to tell too many details and make the story too long, but let me see if I can hit the balance. Some of you have been to my apartment. I live in a beautiful apartment in a wonderful section of town. It is completely safe. And it's very, very quiet, except on the weekends after 2 p.m. on Friday night, Saturday night, when all the bars have closed. Okay? Is that making sense? Okay? And three, yeah, after 2 a.m. on Friday night, Saturday night, okay, it's still a nice place, but it gets to be a little bit louder as the bars have apparently closed in my neighborhood and people have to leave. And three, three, nights, uh, three weekends ago, I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And as I woke up at, at 4 o'clock in the morning, I was like, why, why in the world am I awake? What in the, why, why am I awake this early? And as I was awake, my, the windows in my apartment were open, and I heard, and it, and it was a woman who was in distress, and she was, she was yelling at a man. And this man was yelling at this woman. And as I looked out my window, I couldn't see the woman, I couldn't see the man, but even though it was 4 o'clock in the morning, I could see somebody else on the other sidewalk, and he was walking with his phone, and he was looking, and he was walking and looking, and he walked on by. And I thought, hmm, I wonder what in the world's going on. And then I started to go back to bed. And if you understand me, I felt like such a coward. I am a father of three daughters. It is possible that some woman is being attacked 
and I'm just going to go back to sleep. And so I changed my clothes, and I went out about 4 o'clock in the morning, and I looked down the sidewalk, and there was no one in the sidewalk. And then I walked down to the end of my block, and ironically, even at 4 o'clock in the morning, there were lots of people different places. And I, I went into a little 24-hour store that was open, and then I stepped out, and then I walked down to the end of the block, and then I made a turn, and I came back up another block, and, and I was seeing people all along the way. They weren't scary people, but there were not people that I would choose to spend time with at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Painting a picture for you? And then ironically, as I got back making the the loop around the block, just as I got back to my street, again, where I would turn and go back, there was a police car that showed up with its lights whirling. And the police officers were a bit like me. They were looking. They were looking. And I didn't see anyone. They didn't see anyone. I, I don't know the rest of the story. Was it just a couple that were fighting with each other? If, if this makes sense, that's my best case scenario. Does that make sense? That it wasn't a woman who was being abused, that ironically, sadly, it was just a couple that had had too much to drink and they were simply yelling at each other, which is not unusual. Am I making sense in my story? But do you really understand, for me, the problem? I felt like such a coward. I can read everything in the world about being strong, about being courageous. But when I hear a woman's voice who's obviously in distress at 4 o'clock in the morning, my first reaction is to simply close the windows and go back to bed. If you falter in a time of trouble, how small is your strength? And we go on to Proverbs chapter 25, the next slide, verses 11 and 12. Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? Our, our next slide there, Louisa. It's so easy in times of trouble to say, well, it's not my job. Or to say, well, I, I don't know. I don't know the whole situation of what's going on. And in fact, following World War II, the chief defense of the, of the high-ranking Nazi officials that were taken to the Nuremberg trials, th their chief defense that they tried to put forward was, well, we didn't really know what was going on. And it really wasn't my job, I was just following orders. And yet they were found guilty. In my own heart, if I'm making sense, I was found guilty. No, I didn't see it, but I knew something was going on. But my first reaction was just to hide behind this defense. Well, it's not my job. And after all, I don't really know what's going on. This man is talking to his child, who perhaps would go on to be a leader in the country. And he's saying to this child to rescue others. And the fact is that there are times, this next slide, Louisa, yes, there are times when I'm supposed to help. I'm not supposed to hide behind some excuse that it's not my job and that I don't really know what's going on. That's, that's, that's a flimsy excuse. I hide behind it a lot. But there are times, and um, there was interesting as I was, as I was preparing this week, I was, I was reading lots of different things as I do every week. There was a man who was born in 1757. He lived until 1818. The man's name is Samuel Romilly. Is there anybody who knows Samuel Romilly? I had never heard of this man before, okay? Samuel Romilly. Now, again, if I'm making sense to you, where I live is not only very safe, 
it's literally just right down the alley from the Elta Law Faculty here in Budapest. I, I just happened to live just literally right down the street from one of the most respected law universities in the whole country. But in my own research this week, I came across this man in different commentaries named Samuel Romilly. He lived in England, 1757 to 1818. He was a lawyer, he was a politician, and as he was looking at England's penal codes, there were all of these different laws that the, the penalty was the death penalty. And as he was looking at all these different laws in his country, there was a death penalty for forgery, there was a death penalty for shoplifting, there was a death penalty from, a, from stealing from a home, there was a death penalty stealing from a shipwreck. Now knowing the history of England, I think that one about the shipwreck is especially fascinating. Okay, because those of you who know that how England ruled the world, it was heavily dependent upon the shipping industry at one time. And there was even a death penalty if someone stole five shillings or more. Now with inflation, five shillings back in those days was much more than five shillings is now, admittedly. But as he was looking at all of these things, he began to present legislation to abolish the death penalty for forgery, shoplifting, stealing from a dwelling house, stealing from a shipwreck. He introduced all these different legislations. The legislations went through in the House of Commons, but guess what? They didn't go through in the House of Lords. And so the death penalties remained on the books until after he died. After he died, many of the things that he introduced, they were accepted by, by British law. And as another footnote, even though he's not the most well-known person, you might have guessed this, when it came to abolishing the slave trade, guess who was one of the lawyers who was very much involved? Samuel Romilly. He was a man... He's, he didn't say that stealing should be forgiven. No, no, he, he, as a lawyer, there was legislation. But he put into practical effect to try to rescue people that were literally going to be killed for such an offense. There are times in my life that I'm supposed to help. Maybe it will not be as famous as Samuel Romley. Maybe it will not be as significant as David facing Goliath. Maybe it will never be known outside of my own heart. But there are times that I'm supposed to help. Next saying, saying 26, verse 13. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 13. Eat honey, my son, for it is good. Honey from the comb is sweet to your taste, Know also that wisdom is like honey for you. If you find it, there is a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Now, there's this simple, simple principle if you go out into nature, okay? This is the way God has created our world. If you eat something and it's bitter, most of the time it's bad. <laughs> and if you find something out in nature and it's sweet, most of the time, guess what? It's good. That's the way God created. That's an overly simplistic. And I know there are specialists, and after the sermon, somebody might come up and say, well, actually, Pastor Ed, these herbs that are bitter are actually quite good for your digestion. I understand. And I know that some of you like spicy food, which is not a flavor. Spicy food is not a flavor, it's a pain sensation, and some of you are addicted to pain, and so you love the most spicy food, and I understand, I understand, so I'm being overly simplistic, but in the simplest terms, if I'm out in nature and I see something that God has created, he made it in such a way that bitter is bad and sweet is good, and it is ironic that there is something unique about honey 
that scientists say even though honey is taken and can crystallize, technically honey never spoils. That's fascinating. And they've done experiments when they've even taken honey, this is a bit morbid, from the graves of mummies, and they've done whatever you do to it to make it eatable again, <laughs> and they've proven that even honey, that's hundreds, maybe even thousands year old, never spoils. It's that pure, it's, it's that good. And so the writer is saying to his child, wisdom is like honey for you. If you find it, there is a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. Whatever you are facing in your life, wisdom, not just philosophically, not just intellectually, but emotionally, spiritually, if you find God's true wisdom, you find hope. And everybody needs hope. There's faith and there's hope and there's love. It's one of those things in the triad. We all need hope. And where do I find my hope? Well, I find my hope in godly wisdom. I find my hope in godly teachings. I find my hope in Jesus Christ, who is the living word. I find my hope by studying God's word, which is the written word. I find true wisdom, and we've talked about this repeatedly, in a world that is full of fools. And that's a harsh thing for me to say. But we are living in a world of fools. And we are being surrounded by teachings that are just stupid and worse than that, are harmful and damaging. And we need as Christians to be looking for God's wisdom, how it applies to our lives. Proverbs chapter 24, verse say, saying number 27, verse 15. Do not lurk like a thief near the house of the righteous. Do not plunder their dwelling place. For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again. But the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. As we've gone through the series of sermons, this, this is, this is, this is a, a theme that's, that's fascinating to me. The number of times that he encourages his child, don't get caught up in the actions of evil people. Don't be a mocker. Don't be a schemer. Jumping ahead to next week, He's going to say, don't rejoice when your enemy has something bad happen to them. And, and those of you who speak German, you know that there's even a German word that I get pleasure out of seeing when my enemy has something bad happen to them. So there's, there's even words in different languages where, where I get this pleasure out of saying, <laughs> finally, look at what happened to him. I, God's been my enemy. He's my jerk. I, oh, but in this situation and in other sayings, repeatedly, he reminds his child, adopt a higher standard of morals and values and actions. Don't lurk like a thief. Don't be a mocker. Don't be a schemer. Don't be someone who rejoices when evil. Don't participate in the acts of violence. Adopt a higher standard of morals and values and actions. And yes, even though the world and even though people might be tempted to do these things, why do teenage boys around the world, why do they do stupid stuff? Because they combine with other teenage boys. Okay, and I'm going out on a limb because I didn't fact check what I'm about to say, okay, but statistically speaking around the world, I think, I think, I think the vast majority of all violent crimes around the world are conducted by young men that are somewhere in their 20s to 30s, especially if there is no father in the home. 
especially if a young man grows up in a family, he might have the most wonderful mother in the world, but if he doesn't have a godly father who teaches him, I think in my home country I can speak with more confidence, (laughs) but I think that even around the world this statistic is borne out, that time and time and time again violent crimes are committed by young men in their 20s and 30s. Not only them, and not only men, there are women also. But we shouldn't be doing that. We should be adopting a higher standard of morals, values, and actions. And the next slide, there is the reminder, the righteous will rise and the wicked will fall. I'm sorry. You might be in one of those situations literally right now that you're getting knocked down, as the Bible says. Righteous people might get knocked down seven times. And of course, that's, that's, a, that's a powerfully symbolic number for the Hebrew people. It, it, I mean, it's, it's profoundly meaningful to them, okay? And it... And it it could be literal, but it's much more than that. It, going to the New Testament, when, when Peter was talking to Jesus, he said, I get it, I get it. I'm supposed to forgive my brother seven times 70. And Jesus says, well, even more than that. Seven times 70, help me do the math, is 490. Okay? If God only forgave us for 18 months, is that the life that you and I would want to live? No. We, you and I are trusting on the fact that God forgives me. I don't know about you, but God forgives me more than just seven times 70. God's taken me far longer than 18 months of my life. But back to this powerful statement, even if you're knocked down seven times, the righteous, God will help the righteous, and the righteous will stand again. However, the wicked they're going to fall into calamity. So as we think briefly about life applications today, as we look at these different sayings, they're like pearls on a necklace. It's not that this saying goes hand in glove with this saying. They're like pearls on a necklace, but if we just look at these things, life applications in your own life this coming week, As we look at these three sayings today, here's a reminder. We need to help others. We need to. And it's entirely possible that this coming week you will have the opportunity to either help or not help. And it's entirely possible that you'll be tempted to say, well, it's not my job, or, oh, I don't know. And yet, that's not the way we're supposed to be living as Christians. Number two, find wisdom. Find godly wisdom. Find biblical wisdom. If you find wisdom, you know what else you find? You find hope. And then also remember that you and I are to adopt higher standards. Nikolai. Church, let us let us all st- stand up, please, for the final.
thank you. You may be seated in the life of our church. If you're worshiping with us today at both doors, uh, please, there's a simple card. If you would give us permission to be in contact with you, uh, it's a great help for us. It's electronically each week. Our church administrator, Andy, sends out an an update on Fridays. We try to give as much information as we can about upcoming events, uh, but we need your permission to be able to in contact with you. So today, if you don't mind, at that door, at the back coffee area, th- there's some simple cards, and please take one of these ink pens. I love IBCB. It's just a simple, and as you take one of those ink pens, uh, selfishly, you know, please pray for us. <laughs> take, take the ink pen, and as you think about us from time to time, Please pray for us as a congregation. If you need a Bible, uh, please take one of those Bibles also. We have a web page. uh, We have a Facebook page. We give lots of information on that, but we give out even more specific information uh, in our weekly newsletter. At the end of every service, uh, we want to pray. Uh, You might be here today, and you've got something very significant on your heart, and you would really like to pray with someone else. Uh, Today, at the end of our service, Cyprian and Louisa, they will be just discreetly over here uh, to your right, to my left, and they will be praying with people. Coming up, it's the month of August. If you're you're worshiping with us for the first time, I know it's so silly, but August is so much different for us than when we get into September, October, November, and we've got all the program, we have all the things going on for the men, all the things going on for the ladies, et cetera, et cetera. August is just kind of a, a... uh, I don't know what you call it. Uh, uh, I don't want to call it an off month, but I don't know what else to call it. It's just a different month for us. But getting towards the end of August, our ladies are beginning their monthly meetings again. Preeti, Preeti, will you kind of wave at people? Preeti is going to give our benediction in just a moment. So if, if you're a lady and you would like to know more about the women's ministry, Preeti can give you lots of information. Iris, who was also in the worship time, Iris is in the very back. They can give you lots more information, but on the last Saturday of this month, August the 26th, there's going to be a breakfast meeting, 930, at their normal meeting place at the Montage uh, Center, the KMK Center, and so you can know more about that. The last Sunday of this month, August the 27th, there are some people who have expressed interest in being baptized. Uh, We had a baptismal in July. And we hope to have another baptismal two two weeks from now, Sunday, August the 27th. If you would like to be uh, baptized, please come and talk to me afterwards, uh, and we will give you more more details about that. The refugees continue to be on people's hearts, and there's multiple ways that uh, people can give uh, different big charity organizations. Uh, It's not refugees. It's homeless people living here in, in Budapest, but there is something that's also called the Homeless Church, and this, this large clear box over here. If you've got really good clothing that you would like to donate, and yes, this is where... I'm sorry, some people have brought some old dirty clothing that wasn't even washed, and they put it in the... That's, we don't need that, Okay. I'm sorry if I'm being too harsh or too... We don't need your old, dirty clothing that you yourself don't even want to wear anymore. If you've got something nice, if you've got something clean, and this next part I know is silly, one of the number one needs is... I'm sorry, this it's a fresh, never-been-worn packet of underwear, men's underwear, okay? If you're willing to go buy a packet of three or four, you know, men's briefs and bring that, those are good donations that can be passed along that genuinely help those in the homeless church. Women's clothing is needed also, but statistically speaking, men's clothing is, is, the, bigger, is the bigger need. So there's ways to help with refugees, there's also ways to help with the homeless church. Bela and Augie, they collect all, once the box gets full, they take this over to the homeless church. Uh, as a congregation, all of the money that we receive, we take 10% of that money and we distribute it to different mission agencies. Uh, and so you, you also have that as part of our giving. And then, of course, we have our own giving. 
we've been giving this announcement because it's great news for us. It, it requires some nuance. Those of you that are members of the congregation, you know that because of the fuel, because of the increase in fuel expenses, everything here in Budapest, though if you're a longtime member of the congregation, as we ended December, as we went into January of this year, the school talked to us and said, we're going to have to double your rent. And that was, that was a huge challenge for us. Uh, praise God, there have been some people that have been giving wonderfully, and we are so appreciative of that. In July, excuse me, it, it became effective in July, but a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, technically, Andy received a new contract from the school, and they readjusted the budget. It's, it's still an increase from last year, but instead of increasing it 100% as it had been January through June, we now have a 20% increase. And, and so I, I, this is where I don't know that I'm communicating because I feel we are so, so grateful that the rent is no longer doubled, but there was still a 20% increase. <laughs> And so it's not like, oh, good news, we don't have to worry anymore. No, we still need to depend, and we do thank you for the faithful giving uh, to us as a congregation. And it's not only for our rent, for paying for other things as well. As we have our offering today, I'm not sure, Wong, who's going to help us maybe pass, pass around the offering. We try to be generous. We try to be not under compulsion but from a joyful heart, and we try in each of our own ways to be self-sacrificial in the giving that we provide. Father, we do thank you for the good things that you've given to us, Father, including the finances that you've given to us. And Father, as we have received, Father, it is our desire to be generous, to be cheerful, to be self-sacrificial, Father, ourselves in our giving. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. As we move in time to the time of our benediction, uh, Cyprian and Louisa, would you go ahead and slip over here? Cyprian, would you go ahead and, oh, I see, I'm making you do two things at once. Louisa, Cyprian, um, if you would like to pray with someone when the worship service concludes, Louisa, Cyprian, they will be here, and they will be more than happy to pray with you about any specific thing that might be heavy on your, heavy on your heart. Um, I know in my own life this past week there have been some very specific things that have been heavy on my own heart, and I've really appreciated, um, I really appreciate when I get a chance to pray with other brothers and sisters in the Lord and as they join me in those prayers you could be in a similar situation today that there's something very significant on your heart and so Cyprian and Louisa would love to pray with you would you please stand as Preeti comes and Preeti leads us in our benediction Preeti Thank you, Pastor Ed. I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 22 to 24. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir 
one another to love and good works. This is the word of God. Go in peace.